Well, I guess I started by, um, like everyone else, taking a class. And I saw this guy up there talking about all this incredibly interesting stuff about animal behavior and then later about child behavior. And it just occurred to me, wow, they're paying him to do this. And I thought, that's a good job. I think I want to do that. One of the things that characterizes Piaget is he kind of looks at children like they're another species. You're, you're looking at them from a distance. And, um, and when you start looking at children like that and you make the comparison to uh, animals, um, well, it's just, I think it's naturally fascinating to everyone. I'm no different. In our most recent work, we've been focused on cooperation. So in the past, we've looked at social cognition in general, how individuals understand one another. Um, but now, what we think really makes humans different compared to our nearest primate relatives is the way they put their heads together. So we're looking at how children uh, form joint goals and decide to do something together, how they plan together to make it happen, uh, how they divide the spoils at the end. This is something that chimpanzees have a lot of trouble with, that um, uh, they may do something collaborative, but then they fight over the food at the end, and so they can't maintain the collaboration over time. Um, and so we're looking at a whole variety of aspects of uh, collaboration. About a decade ago, I think uh, everyone sort of believed that um, uh, great apes uh, really didn't understand the mental states or the minds of others uh, at all. That was probably the majority opinion. And then in the last decade, a lot of research has come out that indeed they do. But our working hypothesis has been that they are doing that in order to compete with one another. So they're trying to figure out what the other one sees and what his goals are uh, so that they can get the food first or so they can get the mate first or, or whatever. And what really makes humans different is not that they can read one another's mind in some sense, but that they uh, can actually put their heads together. They can put their minds together to uh, collaborate and do things that neither one of them could do alone. One of the things we've been doing recently is looking at slightly older children. Fascinating things is they are starting to create and respond and even enforce social norms. So they want to know not just what's the best way to do it to get your goal, but what's the right way to do it. And there's a sense of right and wrong that's not just a moral right and wrong, but actually here's the right way to use this tool. Here's the right way to play this game. And we've seen some absolutely fascinating um, studies with young children where they see someone else doing something in the wrong way. And they come in and they say, no, no, not like that. It doesn't work like that. You have to do it like this. So there's this sense of uh, objective right and wrong ways of doing things. There's a norm that needs to be, uh, that needs to be met. And, and it's easy to understand why children uh, follow norms. You follow norms to conform to people and to fit in and whatnot. But why do you enforce them? That's a little harder to understand. But there's something about uh, representing the group and its ways of doing things. And if you want to be one of us, this is the way we do it. We do it like this. Those guys over across the river, they do it completely different. They eat disgusting things. They dress funny. They talk funny. We do it like this. And if, and if you want to be with one of us, then this is the right way to do it. So you start seeing children essentially entering into the world of not just responding to the culture and adapting in a way that's good for themselves, but actually serving as a representative of the culture who enforces uh, its social norms on, on other people.